topic that we're going to address is actually something that we see as one of the most current ones that we are facing in Europe, but looking at some statistics of from US, US um, uh, I can see that you also struggle with a similar kind of problem, churchless spirituality. Okay, And this is a phenomenon which has been spreading not only in Adventism, but in Christianity in general. Just last year, I spent some time in uh, San Diego on a big conference, SBL, and they talked about um, SBNRs, uh, spiritual but not religious people, or unchurch and churchless uh, uh, people uh, who somehow leave the church, not because they are not uh, godly and they're not faithful to God, they're not apostatizing by leaving the church, they remain believers, they just don't think that the church is essential. So technically this is the phenomenon which is spread, spreading all over the globe at the moment. And uh, this is shaking the foundations of church. So I think I'm gonna use this occasion to respond to that. And I, I know that most of us, I mean, all of us will face this problem if you're not already facing. And the question we're gonna to ask today, can a person be a true Christian without being part of the church? You know, this is a, this is a main dilemma. Is the church essential for our Christian identity? Um, or is it something that's just peripheral, peripheral something that, that is useful, but not necessarily essential? Um, so just to understand who are, who are those people who are leaving the church? Um, I consulted the study of a sociologist called uh, Alan Jamison, uh, who technically examined the people who left the church, uh, and he had a qualitative study, asking them questions, so why did you leave, what are the reasons? They felt that they are not fitting in in the church, they felt that there are some doctrinal divergences, they felt that uh, they're spiritually and emotionally bullied in a the church, they never feel good enough because of all sorts of standards there and expectations of holiness, um, so they just felt this is not, not for me, I can't fit in. Um, and then there is also a group of people who felt that this church is completely irrelevant, claustrophobic and controlling. And they felt that they, they are powerless there. Even when they tried to change something, it took so much effort and so much time just for church to move an inch. So uh, they just gave up, you know, why would we bother with this? Uh, so they felt powerless and not unable to change anything in the church. And also looking at certain members in the church, even those who spent in the church more than uh, 50 years, it was almost like that, that there is no spiritual growth. You know, they are struggling with exactly the same issues that the people before are struggling. So if this is what I will look like in a few decades, why would I even spend time here? And some people just felt bored. Other one uh, had certain failures and the church failed to handle this in a very Christian way and passion, uh, compassionately. So all sorts of reasons why people are leaving the church. But what was surprising in this qualitative study from Alan Jamieson is that, um, okay, just a moment. The following fact, we are not talking about just young people who are, who are leaving the church because this is all, almost accepted as a mantra, uh, young people leaving the church. No, it's actually the middle-aged people, 35 to uh, 45 years old. Some of them are more than 15 years in a church, so they're, they're not weaker believers who simply leave the church because they don't know better. And 95% were actually in leadership positions. This is something that uh, we did not expect to see. So this is not only constrained to one generation, it's actually intergenerational phenomenon. Now, interesting that the moment they left the church, they remained believers, they be, uh, remained seekers of the spiritual journey with God, and they found uh, like uh, uh, people who are on a similar journey, and they became more eclectic. You know, sometimes they go to spiritual events and they go to barbecue with their friends, Christian friends, they're having Bible study. They just don't want to uh, belong to institution of church. Okay, these are the profile of people. They still long for some kind of community. So the analogy used by Alan Jamieson to describe uh, this deep, profound need uh, that's actually uh, behind this church of spirituality movement is the analogy of a uh, luxury liner in meets cruise. And those travelers, they're abandoning this, this, this ship. They grow tired of the endless buffets and entertainments, the, careful, the carefully designed activities, or the captain who makes all decisions about the ship's speed and direction. And they long to experience what is not on itinerary. They sell all they have to buy a small boat and leave the well-traveled sea lines for the uncharted waters. The sense of adventure, a sense of something alive and vibrant. 
they're looking for that, but they simply can't find in the confines of the church, which is seen as same, uh, which is very institutional, bureaucratic. So there's this kind of anti-institutional sentiment behind protest against formalism, uniformity, and they like a very low level of commitment. Um, so this is the phenomenon that um, we can respond in different ways. And Christians, because they are afraid of losing the traditional forms of church, they have often um, uh, reacted to this by trying to ignore it as it is not happening. But um, putting your, hand, uh, your, your head in the sand will not really resolve the situation. Or they try to fight against in labeling the people who are leaving as not Christian enough. Or they try to escape in different ways or con consent to it. Some people even say maybe this is the way of being Christian, not depending on institutions anymore. We have to be uh, more informal and it's a rather individualistic journey. But I was invited us today to try to engage with this phenomenon constructively. Uh, because I believe this can be actually an alarm for Christian church. A reminder that maybe over the time, without us being necessarily aware of it, we lost something of the essence of what's the church supposed to be. So instead of fighting this and this responding negatively, let's see what is the elements that are missing in our current experience of community and church. And maybe we can even grow in this dimension. So this is the proposed constructive engagement um, response to this phenomenon, that we can maybe use this as an opportunity to grow and deepen and strengthen and achieve a more complete manifestation of church relational nature, okay? So this is the challenge, this is, I think, the exciting journey that we can uh, be on today. So how I'll do this, because there is 24 hours of recorded lectures on this on YouTube. You can just type Dikum Lazic Ecclesiology for the longer version of it. If you're really enthusiastic and a bit crazy, go there. Uh, but for now, um, I'm just trying to summarize this in maybe 25 minutes, half an hour, um, one aspect of it, um, koinonia. I use this word because I don't want to use the word community or fellowship in English, because we already have charged were uh, projections on what they mean and usually shaped by some of our broken relationships and families and churches and i just want to try to work for a moment without this prejudice to kind of bracket our thinking for a moment out so we can see if we approach a new testament from these lenses and study this word koinonia which technically means this uh, a very close very intimate connection a shared life community that is very tightly connected. This is the word used in the New Testament to describe this as the key um, essence of the church. It's found 39 times there, but I will not walk you through all the text. I'll just summarize six conclusions and dimensions that, that were part of this dynamic, dynamics of the early community of Quinonia. And then we, maybe in the light of this, we can see that we can learn something from that. And then we'll discuss whether it's possible to apply this, especially in this kind of lockdown conditions. Okay, so um, here is like a summary of a Bible study that we can discuss in groups later. I we'll have some questions prepared. So when you follow different occurrences of this word in New Testament, uh, koinonia, um, you can notice that <coughs> there are certain patterns that can be discerned. One, koinonia comes as a result of divine initiative, okay? It's a theocentric reality. It's not something that people just agree to meet up like a social club and we have common interests. Let's say we all like music, it can be music club or drama club or whatever other interest-based clubs are. It's not a business organization primarily. No, it's actually a community that's in the Testament is claimed it's actually formed by God. It's initiated from above, and God stands in the center of this community. So the word is found in Acts chapter 2, um, when the Holy Spirit came for, during the Pentecost, and he, there was a big outpouring of this power of the Holy Spirit. And the first result when the Holy Spirit comes is the creation of Koinonia. He's even called the Pneuma Koinonia, so the, the spirit of the, of the Koinonia, uh, because he's the one who generates this community. He works within the believers. He works through them, through their spiritual giftedness. He works around them through providence. And he is the one creating the community that is centered around God. Interestingly, when the New Testament talks about uh, the emergence of this new community, 
it also records the response of Gentiles um, um, who were visiting Jerusalem and seeing this newly formed community. The word that's used to describe their response was phobos. And okay, we, trans we translate it currently with the word fear, but it's not only necessarily a fear uh, as the emotion, it's rather a, like a reverential fear, sense of awe. Um, and it's used usually when God performs some miracle, something which goes beyond human capacity. Let's say Jesus comes to see and controls the natural elements, you know, and reaction of students of his disciples were like, wow. So that's Phobos. Wow. This is something beyond human ability to really explain. It's this mysterious reality. You can't fully even put words to it. Um, that's why in New Testament we have more than 96 metaphors to describe the reality of church. Trying to use a very limited analogies from our life. Architectural analogies, we had the temple of God or bodily images with the body of Christ or army or all sorts of other images because one is simply not enough. There's edge to our words to describe the reality that is divine reality. So imagine if the current generation of people, when they meet in these communities, if they really felt this power of the spirit and God being the center of it, something beyond human is present, something spiritual in, in which we feel is here, we can't fully explain it. I think that experience of divine is something that will be like a magnet to many people around. But often, what we see in the church is all too human. We, <clears throat> is, let's say when there's a worship there happening, if you're talking about the context of community within the church service, Often we only see a human reality. We don't discern much more than that. And after a while, why would we be part of that? Especially when we see the human manipulation in politics and we get disappointed very easily and so on. Because the vision of the astonishing alignment of God and his presence is missing. So this is one of the aspects which is important for Indonesia. It starts with God. God is in the center. It's theocentric. And this reality is not necessarily just linked to God. It has horizontal and vertical dimensions. So it's, it has this, it's dual directional, so to say. Um, if you read, let's say, uh, Epistle of John, um, prologue, first four verses, first chapter. Uh, so first John, one to one to four. Their apostle John, who is now experienced uh, disciple, tried to summarize the point of apostolic preaching. And the reason why he did everything what he did in his life. It's a summary of his life in those four, uh, four words. And he says, we preach about this word, uh, everything that we experienced, that we saw, that we hear, heard about the word of life. We preach to you. Why? So that you can have koinonia. This is the end, the very purpose, the heart of apostolic preaching. That you can have koinonia with God and with us. So these two dimensions that he develops in the whole book of John, how you can't say that you love God and then you, love, uh, you hate another person. This triangle has to exist. Now, notice, if the lower part of this triangle is not there, this is something that is like a churchless individualistic spirituality where, where people are related directly to God, but there is no connection between them. This is not koinonia, not a complete one at least. Um, if one of the sides of this triangle is missing, let's say a uh, uh, side towards a guy on the left, um, this would be a mission because one person who is connected to God tries to reach an another one and to help that person come closer to God. If we don't have this, both sides of this triangle, we have something similar to in Europe. Uh, I mean, some of our cultures in my country, Serbia, where I come from, was uh, shaped in this period of communism, you know, so uh, attempt to create the ideal of human community, but without God. Um, and this is not koinonia. There's certain reality which is simply not fully present if there is no another human being. Some, somehow it almost echoes what God says, I, I um, created them according to my own image, like us. Uh, and then he talks about Adam and Eve and like somehow... Being according to that image also means, among other things, means being relational. It's the mode of human existence. And in this relationship that we can experience among the people, we can sense the glimpse of, or experience the glimpse of divine love. And the more we love each other, the more we can experience God in that. And the more we love God, 
that this will result in love towards each other. So this triangle is somehow um, necessary as essential part of Christian identity. And um, it actually provides the fullness, <coughs> provides the fullness for uh, people who are in it, because the verse is finished. I will preach to you about the word of God so you can have koinonia with us and with God so that your joy may be complete. You're talking about the fullness of life you can actually experience in this community. Now, there is another aspect I would like to mention today, which is a holistic aspect. This is a three-dimensional reality, um, multi-dimensional reality, even more, not, not to limit to three. It engages not only human uh, mind, like we are people who believe same doctrines. It also engages our emotions, engages our action even, and our lifestyle. It doesn't happen only within, like in, in Europe, it's like from 11 to 12, this kind of divine service time. That's not a church. There's only one section of the church, one part of it. It's rather a whole life participation in this network of interwoven relationship. Okay, and it engages the full life, not only sharing the ideas. And therefore, you can find this, uh, this word koinonia when you trace the New Testament linked to different realities. They have koinonia of faith, koinonia in suffering even. Um, and then in one occasion, it happens that the church in Jerusalem was poor. Different people in um, Greek churches were sending koinonia to them, technically money. So where, where money goes often reveals where our heart is, okay? And, and this is the aspect which um, material manifestation of love is also included here. It's not only the, the relationship of words where we say we love each other. Actually, it shows when somebody's in a crisis, when somebody needs even financial help, we, we carry that person. Now, um, 1996, in Serbia, um, I, I'm born in the like northern part of Serbia, in a small village next to the river Danube, which is the largest river in, in Europe. And maybe 12 kilometers away, there's my aunt who has a farm there. It's a beautiful farm. And at that time, they completed the house, fully polished it after 26 years, you know, you know how people are gradually doing all sorts of final touches. And the day it was finished, um, the fire came. I think there was some installation problems. And the whole house, burned in, in an hour or so and uh, her husband and two boys that she had they, they were left without any house and without any insurance so literally on the street and um, that was a very tragic event for them but what impressed me the most is that in that time this is now remember this is a time of war in Serbia but people are constantly living on the verge of life and death and uh, if you don't have a job if something like this happens you're on the street it really is um, a very dangerous reality but the church that they were part of came the same day like people just came there more than 100 people were there and they decided to um, help them first clean up all this mess and then build a new house now one interesting thing is that uh, when the house burned everything burned even the closet like a wooden things like furniture but the church tithes which tied because she was a treasurer of the church in the paper envelope uh, stayed on the ashes there you know completely untouched so they used this envelope to uh, invite for the offering during the during the sabbath uh, explaining what's happening and this became legend in a very secular environment there like barely anybody christian like how is this possible wood burns but not the, the paper envelope um, and uh, people were really encouraged, and they came to, to work there. Some people contributed with uh, the bricks, other people brought other, other building materials, some people just had a skill, so they came there like carpenters and so on. I was among the cleaners there at the time, and so there were people cooking for us. It was such a nice time. Every day after school, after work, we went there and worked together. It was a time of community, and time where we became very close as a church. They built a double larger house with two floors. And this house since then is used as a house that people who don't have anywhere to live, they even have their room there and the family decided to devote their life into serving community. It's the experience of Koinonia, which mattered here. In the local village, this stayed a legend. This is a very different community. They were standing in awe and in wonder. Wow, look at this. This is something else. 
when something happens to you, there is people who will stand behind your back and who will support you. So somehow this reality, which seems very theoretical, became reality. And it has even financial and material manifestations of it. So that's what we are talking about here. A true support, being there for each other when it matters and when it's crisis period. So this is a glimpse of this quinonia that I experienced when I was younger. Now, once we say that this is a whole life participation that we are talking about here in Koinonia, we have to struggle with how to structure this, how to arrange this logistically, you know, that everybody has their place, but still there will be an issue of overlap. And when somebody's freedom can maybe impinge on the freedom of another person, how do we live together? And in New Testament, I find this kind of interdependent, interdependent uh, structure um, of organization. In Corinthians, you can see it clearly, especially in the image of body of Christ, where there are different parts and they somehow are also united. And the word koinonia emerges as a key one in, in First Corinthians, um, and particularly this context of uh, how do we live together. Now, just a brief explanation here. So these are the three governing models, political models or structuring models you can see everywhere in history. Uh, there is one which tends towards dependency, that one person or group of people, like oligarchy or some kind of elite, is governing, uh, governing others. You know, I don't know whether you have this in your church, let's say a very old Adventist family, very influential one, um, who decides about all the important matters, everybody else, ha everybody else has to comply to that. Um, and um, so what kind of carpet we're going to have, what kind of walls, and you know, it is those people who are very influential and everybody else really are not really respected in those choices. We, I definitely see that uh, more in communitarian cultures, but um, this is a tendency that's often present in our church. Almost the method of coercion is being used to um, press certain model of unity which common good is emphasized, but not individual freedom and, 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 and flourishing. And the method often used here is coercion, trying to establish authority. And if you don't really think this way, you're out. Very claustrophobic uh, way of uh, doing church. And uh, this is not going on in the New Testament, but often our church can have this kind of uh, um, model of governance, A strong, authoritarian, centralized, thinking that suppresses individuality or in originality. On the other side, there is, it's kind of independent. Everybody does what they want, like kind of anarchy, you know? But there is no cohesion between them. I don't know, in London, uh, 10 years ago, they started this, uh, uh, a new initiative they called uh, Silent Disco. So you go to disco club and, um, and there, there is no music. You enter the room, and complete silence and a lot of people, a bunch of people there inside, they all have um, uh, radio receivers or some of headphones or iPods that uh, they receive there or brought their own and they all find their own station, their own channel and then they dance their music. So looking from the outside, uh, you can see a very weird environment. Some people are jumping of joy and some people are being uh, like uh, slow dancing, slow motion, other people dancing salsa, you think they're crazy, you know, also from the outside, like there's no sense of rhythm. Something which connects them is missing. I think this is a great analogy to describe some of the churches with everybody just does what they want. They dance their own rhythm, but the harmony that unites them is not there. And um, technically, both of those are extremes. I think Koinonia in New Testament resembles the middle one, interdependent ministry. And this one is, we still have something that unites us, a shared life and values and, uh, and reality of the spirit, yet each one of us has a meaningful place. You're not reduced only to a number or to the, uh, the financial number of your tithe. You know. It's not the only contribution to give, you, you give to the church, but rather you find fulfillment of your own calling and your own spiritual giftedness in this community. Uh, it's like a, a, this kind of orchestra that, that where you have uh, such a diverse instruments. You have a high piercing piccolo. You have bombastic timpani. You have... Uh, called like English horn or a gentle violin, all sorts of instruments. And you wonder how can they sound together? They're so different from each other, even con like conflicting each other in sound. But then comes the moment when the conductor approaches them and uh, conductor 
uh, raises the stick and then he starts to conduct. And the, as a result, there is magic happening. There is harmony, there is symphony behind. This is what happens in church. We are like a symphonic orchestra, so many different gifts. Some of those instruments um, can even feel maybe replaceable, like piccolo. Sometimes you for a piccolo, the smallest instrument, the high piercing, like a piccolo, you sometimes have two bars in a whole symphonic piece when you have uh, like two hour long piece, you have only two bars to play, a few seconds. And sometimes the, the person can feel, like, why would I attend the whole year of two hour weekly rehearsal when I'll just play those two bars? And, uh, but if piccolo is not there for those two crucial, for a crucial moment, um, when the culmination comes of this symphonic orchestra, if you don't have the width of the tone, the deepest and the highest possible tones, the whole orchestra cannot unlock its richness. One small instrument that makes a difference. And for this, I'll just use a few minutes to illustrate what I mean, how does this model of interdependency then, uh, when everybody is important, even the smallest gifts are important for the fullness of the harmony. Why, how this is important, I will just use the example of my grandma. She grew up in the Second World War in Croatia, South Europe, just near Italy. She has Italian roots. Her mom was part of this noble Italian family, seven sisters. They owned a lot of different uh, bakeries and hotels and so on. And uh, so they were a rich family. But the moment uh, my great grandmother became Adventist, she was rejected as a sectarian. because It wasn't really popular. Even now, it's not popular to be Adventist in Europe. Uh, but in primarily Catholic environment, this was heresy. She's rejected from her noble family. She married a guy out of love uh, who was part of the lower class, you know, like he's a uh, uh, boat builder, you know, and, and they had happy relationship and they got three daughters. And then uh, one day he got bit, bitten by the spider and three days after he died. So now there's a mother unemployed with three kids in the middle of the war, in the time when they were hanging the partisans and soldiers on the street lamps uh, dead bodies around and so on, and there's nowhere to survive. So she had to remarry. But unfortunately, she married a guy um, who mistreated her and kids. They had all sorts of traumas and wounds from that period. And at this time, mother, uh, my grandma's mother, yeah, she got sick while being pregnant. She was sent in the hospital. Nuns were there, Catholic nuns, but they did not want to give her even water. She was really begging for water the whole night and did not want to help her and assist her in giving birth. So she tried to give the birth to herself and she didn't manage. So both baby and she died that night. My grandma comes to see her mom and she, um, when the, she saw them dead, stepfather did not even come for the funeral. They did not even invest into the grave. So they had to throw her in a common graveyard with all the, all the dead soldiers. My grandma had a, a very high soprano, Dalmatian type high, high soprano, and she was the one, only one si singing on, on the funeral of her mom. And soon after that, her sister, uh, older sister died from tuberculosis and younger sister was taken and they saw each other years later, she was adopted by some family. And my grandma is on the street, left alone, nobody else in the world. And um, she said how often she walked in the street and she was looking at the families, dreaming that she can have um, you know, croissant that they're having, or they can, you know, they, or they, she can eat, or she can have, have love like they had. they had. She had to really um, fight. She was completely homeless for years. And then the church accepted her, some people who could accept her, there's an old grandma who accepted her to live in her place while she doesn't find some place to live. And they slept on one small couch, and this old grandma was uh, telling her story. Um, every night, and uh, like the story, but she was telling, repeating this phrase, I know, Angelica, that the sun of your happiness will warm up my old bones, you know, so she was very hopeful and gave me encouraging words. And what happened, my grandma went then um, with young people in the church, they, they went and traveled to Serbia, where they had a youth event, and she was asked to sing, because they all recognized her really beautiful voice. As she was singing in Serbia, maybe 500 kilometers away, um, so she saw a very tall guy sitting in the last row. His name was Isa, uh, very tall, like more than two meters high. I don't know how much is that in uh, measures you're using, but um, 
very tall and he has these black mustaches and he was very handsome and she fell in love immediately while singing and he also fell in love with her without even talking to her and after this they had to quickly leave to Croatia so they did not even manage to talk, to talk together so what happened is she goes home in Croatia he's in Serbia and they're like longing for each other um, and without knowing and then one day the letter arrives to the church a name with my grandma's name there. And um, she did not know the Cyrillic to read, which is Serbian letters. So she went to the pastoral office, asked for translation. There's a whole pastoral office now translating the letter, which she did not know was a love letter. And the letter says, Dear Angelka, will you marry me? Well, at that time, it wasn't as complicated as these days, it seems. Uh, you love the girl, you just chase her you know, and get her. But um, I, maybe I would not recommend it today. But uh, so she was so happy for a moment but then became very sad because she knew that the moment he finds out truth about her and her brokenness and she's alone and everything that he's just going to disregard her so she decided to take off her mask and present herself as she is dear isa i'm naked i'm alone i don't have anybody i don't have any possession any property any nothing uh and i thought you should know this um before you make your decision sorry i cannot accept your proposal and then she sent the letter back and she was sad um, and the letter did not come back for a long time maybe a month or two i don't know afterwards he sends the letter back um, and again pastoral office received the letter and they need to now translate it to her um, and in the letter there were those words of his that each time she told me this story, and by the way, when she tells this story, it lasts five hours, so I'll spare you the details. It's like five minutes. Um, she always cries. There was something in those words that completely touched her in the place in her heart that, that, that unlocked her completely as a person. In this letter, he simply said, um, Dear Angelka, I did not ask you whether you are poor or rich or whether you have somebody or not, or whether you're naked or not, whether you have food or not. I did not ask you that. I asked you, will you marry me? For the first time in her life, she felt accepted for who she is. Somebody who knows her brokenness, knows that he comes with a package of all sorts of things, still says yes unconditionally, loving her. For their wedding, um, she came to Novi Sad and there was a big wedding organized by Novi Sad Church. And you know how there is a, a groom's family and then bride's family coming, standing up uh, as the agreement that they can, uh, they gave their yes. For his family, people stood up, but then comes her turn and nobody stands up because there was nobody around her. The church quickly realized that and they all stood up for her. It was a very touching moment for her. And she said at that day, she promised to God that she will love this man back with full heart and also she promised that she will have her door open for her family which is this church and people who are broken who are homeless so this is one lady who experienced the touch of god through another human being and completely changed her brokenness into something else what comes after after this was five decades of amazing marriage um, in our house, more than 70 people live, not at the same time, of course, but over time. Some people stay for a year, two, three years. My grandma, was, grandfather was teaching them how to do carpentry, and she was teaching them how to cook and do different things. Uh, at the time, it's a very patriarchal culture, as you can imagine. And, uh, but those, some of those people became um, Adventists and Christians and very successful people today, and some of them living in America and working in universities and so on. One lady changed more than 70 lives. But what's paradoxical about all this is when you ask her, um, so what can you do? What's your spiritual gift? I don't have any gifts. God didn't give me any gifts, you know. So she always sits in the last row in the church. Um, and when nobody is noticing, she notices who, who she can invite for lunch, about lunch, or those people who are rejected. She has a heart for them. And she comes and she knows how to tell them the right word and how to encourage them. So often I had the following situation, that my friends come to my house, but they, before they come to me, which I'm living on the second floor, they come from the first floor to her when they have some tr trouble because she always had the right word for everybody there. And um, she, wherever she went, she created communities. The woman, she says, I don't have any gifts. 
So she can be like this piccolo I mentioned, the thing that I'm mean, insignificant, but without that, the fullness doesn't work uh, of, the, of the symphony. There is no full of sound. So neither one of us can say that we don't have giftedness. At this point, I emphasize uh, not spiritual giftedness, um, how we usually talk about when you have skills and talents and gifts. I think this is a given. We all know that this is what we contribute to the church. But I want to encourage each one of us that even our brokenness in God's hands can be used as means of koinonia. When the Holy Spirit takes you under his will, you know, he creates, out of ashes creates beauty. Out of brokenness, uh, you can see now his ama an amazing display of his life, love. And in our weakness, his power is seen most vividly. So when I'm talking about inter interdependency, I'm also uh, thinking about these experiences. We bring from the past broken families, damaged in all sorts of ways. But somehow, when we are guided with the Holy Spirit, with this conductor who conduct the pieces, which are so different instruments, the miracle of harmony and unity happens without suppressing individuality, without suppressing and coercing people to certain molds. So this is something that I think is the base of Koinonia in New Testament. And briefly, just for the next uh, two, three minutes, I will explain the last two points. So this Koinonia in New Testament is not only the, this lively, interdependent, spirit-led uh, community, it's, it's it expands in two directions, inwardly and outwardly. Notice that in um, the epistle, the Acts, when you read there, when the Holy Spirit came, the number of people was growing. So there is this kind of external numerical gro growth, if you want, um, that this community is somehow enhancing and overflowing, not only confined within certain walls, because that's the nature of true love that, that, that uh, feeds into koinonia. It's not self-centered. But also, at the same time, the relationship within are growing. So this is the nature of true koinonia. It has both focuses. Sometimes we can function in extremes as church. Our church can become so self-centered. We grow inwardly in this mutual love. We became very good friends. And then whoever comes from the outside feels a bit not welcome because it's so hard to get in. We create a very fixed groups and clans, you know, and then stick to that. Um, we become like a social club, not interested in the world around. On the other side, we can become like, like those societies who are only interested in projects outside. We do evangelistic meetings. We have all sorts of celebrity presenters. We organize projects and events, but we don't have where to bring those people to. Because if they come to this community, they will realize that actually we can't live together. The moment you scratch this community, this surface, you, you see a lot of blood there, a lot of uh, um, you know, arguments and conflicts and so on. So both of those extremes are actually not what New Testament is talking about. A healthy community grows in mutual love. And this becomes the magnet which attracts others that they want to come here. We don't need to convince them. We just are koinonia. And people intuitively feel that this community gives us something more, maybe reveals the true purpose why we are created, not only to live individually like isolated islands, but we are persons in communion. We are persons in community, a relational being by definition. And this divine love that we experience in this community unlocks our full potential so we can experience the fullness of joy. And this is how we come to the next aspect, which we often forget, that church is not only um, tied to this earth. There's this cosmic dimension behind, a very important cosmic role that the church has, and this cosmic aspect of church and koinonia. And you can see this in verses such as this. I'm going to just quote one of my favorites. Um, in the epistle of uh, Ephesians uh, 3.10, Apostle Paul now exp uh, expands one of the most beautiful visions of the church in New Testament in the epistle of, um, of Ephesians. And he says that there was a secret, was hidden from the beginning. This mystery was hidden. And now it's revealed to him. And then the verse comes, God's purpose in all this was to use the church, to use Quinonia, to display his wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Look at this. It's a part of the cosmic story that engages all the celestial beings of this universe. 
and church has this integral, very important place in God's plan of salvation to reveal, to be like a portrait of God and his uh, wisdom in its rich variety. Somehow when, when the whole universe looks, looks at this bunch of broken, imperfect people, and when they saw this amazing divine love connecting them, creating, creating perfect harmony, spirit, spirit-led miracle, initiated miracle, they would say, wow, this is more than just a human. So this is a part, a church becomes a part of God's self-revelation. This is not an inst- only the instrument that God uses to proclaim, to proclaim the gospel. This becomes also an end. We preach to you so you can be part of koinonia. Koinonia doesn't only come as a means to preaching, but rather it's end in itself. When everything else stops in this universe, even evangeliz- uh, evangelizing and mission, one day when Christ comes and people will know him, what stays is koinonia. I will be their God and they'll be my people. There's a mutual indwelling, mutual koinonia that remains for the whole eternity, revealing that koinonia is the ultimate purpose of human life and the, and the purpose of human community. So, so here it is. Um, for this to happen, it doesn't come overnight, of course. Okay? We need to develop a new openness to God who works through his spirit within us, through us, around us, to be so aligned with him, to hear this conductor who conducts, you know. And he opens our eyes and he uses us, even though if we are instruments which we think are unimportant in this big symphonic piece, you know. But he then helps us to see how, even though we are very different uh, with people around us, we are joined in love. We are pressing together with people who are even so different than us, they have completely different theological stance, but we are not living in, po- in position, uh, in opposition to them, but we are able to live with otherness in this community, with somebody who is completely other than us, completely different than us. Whether they are, uh, uh, whether they are fundamentalists or, uh, or ultra conservatives or, or fundamentalist liberals, you know, and, um, and, uh, or whatever, communists or cultural audiences, all sorts of audiences we have today, no matter who they are, we are still able to be together and to appreciate each other's differences, not as something which diminishes koinonia, but rather presents it in its rich variety. We can learn from each other. And towards the world, we should embody the message. Instead of trying to convince the people who are leaving the church, please come back, please come back. No, be the church. This will speak for itself. This will be the magnet which will draw them back. And um, this is something which is not only, I think, part of my projection. It's promised in New Testament, 1 Corinthians 1.9, which is one of the key uh, texts of the Prol of Corinthians, which is one of the key book where the Koinonia theology is developed. It says, God is faithful by whom you were called into the Koinonia of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So it's not human invitation. It's based and it's rooted in God's faithfulness, his covenantal faithfulness. He has this plan, he promised, and he called us into Koinonia. It guarantees that this is more than just utopia. It's the mandate, it's a calling and a gift at the same time that we get. Um, and to finish with a paraphrase, adaptation of 1 John 1, 1 to 4, that I started with, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, seen, and touched, we proclaim to you, said you also may have Koinonia with us and with God. These things we proclaim to you so that your joy may be complete. It is in this relationship that you experience what it truly means to be human in relation, what, it really, what the purpose of our whole life and existence is, koinonia with God and with others. So be the church you wish to see. And I'll finish with the phrase of Martin Luther, um, big reformer. He said, gospel is like a caged lion. You don't need to defend the lion just release it. So similarly to the church, it's like a caged lion. We think it's constrained. We need to now free and fight for the lion. Don't need to fight. Release it. Be the church. Lion is strong enough to fight for himself. There's certain power which is available through the Holy Spirit given to this community and its rich variety. When we are truly what the church is, people will not feel the need to leave the church as something which is peripheral. Why? Because they will experience 
that actually this community creates the context where I can truly be myself and fulfill all my potential and my joy can be complete. So this is, this is my invitation to you. Be the church. Unleash the power of the community in your experience.